the end of it. So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you very much to our panelists. My name is Renee Lloyd uh, with Northwatch and I'm joining from the North Bay from the traditional territory of the Nipissing First Nation and within the Robinson Huron Treaty area. So uh, the zoo to the rights holders uh, in this region and uh, I would welcome everyone to enter their land acknowledgement into the chat as we go through the session. So this is the fourth in, New in Northwatch's annual series, Nuclear Waste Online, and we're really pleased to join with Nuclear Waste Watch in hosting this session, uh, Plutonium, How Nuclear Power's Dream Fuel Became a Nightmare. And I'm gonna hand it over now to Susan O'Donnell, uh, who with me is on the Nuclear Waste Watch campaign steering committee. And uh, Susan is going to set this session in the context of the current uh, campaign to ban reprocessing in Canada. And uh, Susan then will introduce Ramana and we'll move on with the session. So thank you so much for joining us. And Susan, over to you. Thank you, Brene. And hello, everyone. Lovely to see so many of you join us tonight. As Brene mentioned, I'm Susan O'Donnell. I'm living in Fredericton, New Brunswick in Willostake territory on the bank of the Willistuck, the St. John River. This territory was never ceded or surrendered and we live here under the terms of the Peace and Friendship Treaty signed from 1725 to 1779. Uh, as Bernane mentioned, the webinar this evening is hosted by Nuclear Waste Watch. I'm a member of the Coalition for Responsible Energy Development in New Brunswick one of the webinar co-sponsors and other members of the National Steering Committee on the Radioactive Waste Policy Review are Northwatch, the Canadian Environmental Law Association, the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, the Concerned Citizens of Renfrew County and Area, and the Interchurch Uranium Committee Educational Cooperative. So the federal government here in Canada informally banned plutonium reprocessing in Canada in the late 1970s. And much more recently, the government here confirmed that a policy change will be required to allow it now. And then in 2020, Canada embarked on a review of its radioactive waste policy and hundreds of civil society organizations, Indigenous peoples and nations, and concerned Canadians engaged in the draft policy consultations, and thousands of Canadians called for a ban on reprocessing high-level nuclear waste, which is used nuclear fuel. And then about a year ago, the government released the draft radioactive waste policy, which stated that reprocessing is to be, and I quote, subject to policy approval by the Government of Canada. However, meanwhile, the federal government has given grants to companies to develop experimental plutonium reprocessing technologies as part of federal support for small modular nuclear reactors. And so our National Steering Committee launched the campaign to ban plutonium reprocessing in late December. We have a campaign website with fact sheets, videos, links to further information and to previous webinars, as well as an action tool to write to the federal cabinet to support the call to ban plutonium reprocessing. And the website is reprocessing.ca. We're delighted to welcome a distinguished panel this evening as part of our information campaign. And with that, I'll turn it over to our moderator, MV Ramana, the Simons Chair in Disarmament, Global and Human Security and Professor at the University of New Brunswick. Thank you. Uh, New University of British Columbia. I wish, Ramana, it's UBC. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, as Susan mentioned, I'm joining from the University of British Columbia, which is located in the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. And I'm deeply grateful to be here. Uh, it's my pleasure to moderate this discussion uh, about this uh, outstanding book on plutonium written by three researchers who between them have probably over a century's experience uh, <laughs> of uh, working on nuclear power, on nuclear power and particularly plutonium uh, between them. 
Uh, and uh, much of that experience, of course, comes from Frank Juan Hippel. You all read their bios, so I'm not going to go around through their bios, but I have to say a few words about Frank. Uh, and, and I'm sure that Jungmin and Masa will uh, allow me that liberty because we all sort of learned about this from Frank uh, in, in one way or the other. And uh, so Frank started working on the problem of plutonium and reprocessing in 1974. Uh, a few months after India tested uh, nuclear weapons, and he moved to Princeton University to uh, become a part of what became the Center for Energy and Environmental Studies, uh, and uh, was very influential in, um, in getting the Carter administration to uh, ban reprocessing in uh, the United States and try to stop the pro uh, practice of reprocessing elsewhere. Uh, they didn't succeed as well as they should have, uh, but uh, and that's one of the reasons why we are talking about this issue today. Uh, but <clears throat> that's the experience which uh, Frank is sort of uh, bringing to the table, and he will talk at greater length about uh, what, uh, you know, the problems with reprocessing. Um, and I'll just say that he's, again, with uh, now the program on science and global security, which is part of Princeton University's um, School for Public and International Affairs. Um, and uh, uh, he will be followed by Jungmin Kang, uh, who is an independent researcher uh, as a member of the International Panel on Fissile Materials and used to head uh, South Korea's Nuclear Safety Regulatory Authority. And uh, the last will be uh, Masa Takubo. Uh, Masa uh, is, the, uh, is an independent researcher as well also a member of uh, the International Panel on Facade Materials and a consultant to Princeton University's Program on Science and Global Security. Uh, he operates a nuclear information website called kakujuho.net. Um, and uh, so I'm going to leave the uh, chair to sort of Frank to lead off on this and then followed by Jungmin, followed by Masa. And I'll say a few words after that and open it up to questions. Thank you again for being here, uh, Frank, Jungmin, and Masa. Thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, there, okay. Um, um, just want to move this something out of the way here. Uh, well, uh, Romana reminded uh, reminded us that I've been working on this for 45 years, and unfortunately, there's a saying in Washington, no bad idea ever dies. And uh, so I think we have to uh, educate people again about, on this issue, and, that's, and, and I really appreciate the opportunity to do so. Uh, we we believe the three of us believe uh, in not only banning reprocessing in Canada but banning it everywhere, and uh, you, you've seen the cover of our book. And then uh, then after after we wrote the book, uh, Master Chikubo and I wrote a, a a book a report for the International Panel on Fissile Materials about uh, the the reasons we should ban uh fiscal materials everywhere and, and ban, ban reprocessing everywhere so so the the basic reason is is that uh, reprocessing the purpose of reprocessing is to separate plutonium and it was originally uh developed uh during world war ii to separate plutonium for nuclear weapons and a, a um a bomb based on plutonium was used to destroy Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945. That started an arms race between the, uh, the US and the Soviet Union. And then later on, seven other countries uh, developed nuclear weapons. Uh, and the, the uh, this nuclear weapons have been highly developed technologically there. Um, as, as I show here in the bottom of this slide, uh, that showing for, on the left the insides of the Nagasaki bomb, in which a, a small sphere of plutonium was surrounded by uranium, surrounded by aluminum, 
surrounded by high explosives. Uh, and then uh, the modern version, which is uh, serves as a trigger, uh, almost that power, the same power as the Nagasaki bomb, but quite a lot smaller, uh, a shell of plutonium surrounded by a, a, a shell of high explosives, which is then used to trigger a second, a so-called secondary uh, nuclear explosion. With, and in this example, which I'm showing you, uh, the warheads are small enough so that eight, eight of them can, can sit on top of a submarine launch ballistic missile. And they each of them has, has a, uh, a power 20 times power, more powerful than the Nagasaki bomb, uh, which, which was uh, 20,000 tons of TNT equivalent. Now, the, the, the reason for, uh, uh, for separating plutonium for civilian purposes was, of course, the, the, uh, the nuclear energy pioneers you know, were, were interested in, in that this, had, that this uh, what they discovered be of some benefit to humanity. And the obvious benefit would be nuclear power. But they were concerned that there wasn't uh, uranium was a, seemed like a relatively rare uh, mineral uh, element, and and uh, so they they thought that we, you know nuclear power could never make a big contribution uh, based on the chain reaction uh, that that uh, powered the plutonium production reactors, which was a chain reaction of the of the uranium two thirty five, which uh, which. Uh, constitutes only seven tenths of a percent of natural uranium. So they they invented plutonium breeder reactors uh, to convert the non-chain reacting U two thirty eight, which comprises the remainder of natural uranium, into chain reacting plutonium, which, and which would of course uh, obviously increase the amount of energy you could extract from a kilogram of natural uranium. A hundredfold, and 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 that and and with that hundredfold increase, you could you could you could go to uh, to ores which are hundred times uh, more dilute, and and uh, and basically uh, it looked like you could support humanity for thousands, many thousands of years just on uh, with with uh, these so-called plutonium breeder reactors. Well, this is this is how a um, a, a a breeder reactor uh, 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 would operate. It's fueled by plutonium, and you see here uh, that uh, a plutonium fissioning uh, because uh, a fast neutron came in, and then a, a one of the neutrons, the three neutrons, and come go out of it. In this case. Uh, and uh, one of them goes on uh, to fission another plutonium to sustain the chain reaction. But there are extra plutoniums, and you can see, uh, I'm sorry, extra neutrons coming out of, the, out of the, uh, the fission of the plutonium. And you can see that some of them are, uh, most of what's, uh, the, the rest of the fuel is mostly U-238. And... Uh, so, and many of the neutrons would be captured by the U-238, turning it into U-239, which through a couple of radioactive transformations would become plutonium-239 uh, with a half-life of 24,000 years, uh, pl plenty long enough to, to make a bomb. Now, the, the, uh, in order to, uh, to get more plutonium produced in this way, as was, would be efficient, uh, it was ne necessary to have fast neutrons. And, and uh, the hydrogen in water slows down neutrons. You know, the, in the, um, most of the reactors in the world are water cooled. Uh, so they needed another coolant, which would, which would not slow down neutrons as much. Uh, and, and that was liquid sodium that, that, was, that was chosen. Well, sodium is uh, uh, 
it's very reactive with air and water. And I'll just show you uh, the interaction, the, the reaction with with uh, with water. Uh, right on. I just that way, huh? Two, one. Oh, that's a little. Oh. <laughs> so, oh, oh, oh. Uh, obviously, some some. Uh, whoops, let me just. Some idiots having fun. But they're, showing, they're throwing a uh, pound of, of sodium into into a river, and uh, so, so uh, you you have to take great care to uh, uh, to to uh, uh, isolate the the coolant of a of a sodium cooled reactor from from water and from air, and and uh, and that's hard to do. Leaks happen, and uh, and as a result, uh, uh, most of the uh, prototypes of, of these breeder reactors were down most of the time. And here I just show the uh, the, the the largest prototypes in in um, uh, four four countries: the U.S., uh, United Kingdom, France, and Japan. Before before they all abandoned breeder reactors, and you can see. That uh, the the capacity on the right, the capacity factors uh, range from one per, from zero percent to to thirty five percent, whereas the the global average of water cooled reactors is about eighty percent. Well, this obviously makes uh, would would make a, even if the um, sodium cooled reactors were didn't cost any more than water cooled reactors, and they do, it would make uh, the power from sodium cooled reactors much more expensive. Uh, and so th this is basically why commercialization failed. Uh, three countries are still trying, uh, uh, but for different reasons. Uh, Russia uh, has two uh, prototype breeder, uh, sodium cooled uh, breeder reactors operating. Uh, the first one, uh, they had 14 sodium fires in the first 14 years, but they, they, they're, they're tough, and they, uh, and they, and they finally got it to work. And the second one, uh, you know, is, has been work is more recent, uh, but it's, uh, it's not economically competitive with water cooled reactors, uh, and they just and the decision on building another uh, sodium cooled reactor has been postponed until the 2030s. So it. It's, it's, it's not really been commercial, although the Russian uh, research and development community are still at it, uh, it's not been a success in Russia either. Uh, China and India are, are building prototypes, uh, but for mixed reasons, uh, we suspect. Uh, we, we suspect that a major purpose of these reactors is to produce plutonium for weapons. And in fact, uh, uh, Canada and and the United States helped India launch a breeder its breeder reactor program. And the first thing it did with plutonium and separated was in fact to launch its weapons program. And it still has not uh, completed a, a breeder reactor. Um, so so. Uh, it, you know, the, the cons our concern now is that people have forgotten this history, is that Canada and the United States may be about to repeat this catastrophic mistake of promoting civilian reprocessing again and enabling uh, uh, another route to, to nuclear weapons proliferation. Well, the what hap happened uh, with nuclear power, uh, here I show in this, in this graph, the, the dashed line uh, shows the expectations for the growth of nuclear power in, uh, that the IEA published in 1975. And then the next line down is what actually happened. 
that that in fact uh, uh, in the 80s uh, nuclear power uh, plateaued and uh, and of course uh, breeders were not commercial as they as a projection there um, the it, it turned out that that there were cheaper uh, alternatives uh, to, to nuclear power, uh, natural gas, and now and today, uh, renewables are, are cheaper alternatives, and and the world is is turning away from uh, from nuclear power. And in fact, in the United States, uh, it has to be subsidized. Even the operation, even with the capital costs paid off. Uh, the operation of, of uh, our nuclear power reactors has to be subsidized. The competition from solar and wind is, is so tough. Uh, and the, the, the original problem that uh, breeder reactors were supposed to solve uh, never materialized. Um, you, you see here the price of, of uh, uranium uh, in constant dollars has not gone up. It's been brief. Brief surges based on speculations uh, when it appeared that uh, the nuclear power was going to grow, uh, and then it didn't. And of course, part of the setbacks not only are economic, but also the accidents we've had, uh, the uh, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. Well, we, as a result of, of all this, and uh, of both the weapons the legacy. And the civilian and and the re, and the uh, separation of plutoniums to start up breeder reactors, uh, we have today in the world enough a, a legacy of enough plutonium for a hundred thousand nuclear weapons. Uh, about half of it civilian and half of it weapons. Uh, much of the weapons material has been declared excess. That's uh, it, it actually hasn't disappeared. It's hard to get rid of. Uh, and and uh, and the civilian uh, stock uh, is still growing here. And you can see that the major countries uh, with the big stockpiles are, are, are the UK, which has stopped, finally stopped reprocessing. Russia, which is reprocessing. Japan and France, both reprocessing. And then India, and China have smaller stocks. Well, uh, so what? Why just uh, to, to wrap up here? Why? Why does reprocessing continue in France and Japan? Uh, they decided to keep separating plutonium and using it and recycling it in, into water cooled reactors and so called mixed oxide fuel. Uh, that does reduce the uranium requirements by about 10%, but the, but the, the mixed oxide, the MOX fuel, uh, costs 10 times as much as the low enriched uranium it replaces. And so this, the, the utilities in, in France and, and uh, Japan are only doing this because they're forced to do it by their governments. In France, the government-owned utility uh, is forced to support the huge uh, government-owned reprocessing complex that that uh, the French government uh, doesn't want to shut down. Uh, it was originally built up to uh, because they thought that they could could uh, reprocess spent fuel for other countries, and they did for a while. But today, uh, Electricity de France is the only customer. In the UK, the, the Electricity de France's real feelings about reprocessing were revealed, however, when after it, it uh, bought the, U the nuclear power reactors in the UK, but refused to pay for reprocessing uh, to the UK's government owned reprocessing plant with, with, with the result is that it had to shut down. Uh, in Japan, the government too has forced utilities to reprocess. Uh, and, and perhaps the motivation is uh, because Japan has had a hard time like like the U.S. and Canada had uh, in in uh, setting a, a spent fuel repository, uh, a reprocessing plant provides a central destination to which it can be the spent fuel can be shipped, even though it's unusually expensive to build and operate a, repro a reprocessing plant. So it's very 
expensive interim storage. And then finally, uh, the, the to claim today uh, the, of the benefits for reprocessing is that by getting, and, and especially for sodium cooled reactors, which can fission all isotopes of plutonium, is that getting the, uh, the plutonium out of the spent fuel would reduce the hazard from the radioactive waste. Well, th this figure uh, with all the curves uh, shows the contributions of different radioiso radioactive isotopes to the, to, to the hazard uh, above a repository uh, to a, um, a subsistence farmer, somebody who's drinking the water and, and uh, eating food uh, uh, grown with the, the water. Uh, and you, you can see that uh, uh, different isotopes would, would dominate in different periods, but plutonium actually never is, is the top isotope in terms of the hazard over this million years uh, that, that is shown. Uh, so, so why, so uh, how, do, how do the reprocessing R&D people who are, who, you know, are besieging you as well as uh, our, the US government, uh, you know, why are they doing this? Uh, it's because they're, they're trying to stay alive. And their primary source of funding is, is, is gullible governments. There's no private investment in reprocessing. Uh, in the US, the last private investment was 50 years ago. And there's more generally, there's very little uh, private R&D. Uh, much more, most of the, this is nuclear worldwide. Uh, in all aspects of nuclear power, there's uh, $2 billion of R&D being spent by private companies. Uh, the rest is all, is, is all uh, government. Uh, so uh, this is basically now um, sort of the, the, the relationship that, that was established between the nuclear community and the governments and uh, as a result of the nuclear weapons programs mostly uh, is, is resulted in this continuing relationship which support, is supporting uh, lots of lots of you know the, the small modular reactor uh, development and and, uh, and unfortunately also uh, reprocessing. And I think that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, I now request uh, Jiang Min to take over. He will talk a little bit about pyroprocessing, which is a form of reprocessing uh, that is being proposed in South Korea and why it's not a good idea either. Take it over, Jiang Min. It's also being proposed in Canada. Well, yeah, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, just fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will talk about the pile processing, uh, so-called uh, dry reprocessing uh, in South Korea. Uh, pile processing technology is an uh, electrochemical process to separate plutonium uh, from spent fuel. This technology uh, was developed by the uh, Arrow National Lab in America in 1980s uh, for the uh, integral fast reactor project. Uh, uh, Actually, Frank achieved this project. <laughs> so the this uh, pyroprocessing technology was uh, to reprocess uh, the metal pure uh, of the fast reactors originally. So uh, first, to uh, pyroprocess uh, of the light water reactor span pure, the span pure uh, should be first uh, uh, metallized and then the metallized uh, pure will be uh, solved in the, uh, the molten salt 
and then uh, electrolysis uh, process uh, separate actinides, including uh, plutonium and uh, some uranium and other fission products. Uh, so Kelly uh, also developed uh, this uh, phytoprotecting uh, technology uh, assisted by the uh, American uh, National Lab. And uh, they are carried a uh, propaganda on pyroprocessing is uh, uh, described here. You see that they are saying that uh, spent fuel uh, volume reduction would be 120s and the radio toxicity would be uh, 1000 so on, like this. Uh, by pyroprocessing and uh, also a uh, health reactor. So this uh, slide shows uh, carry the pyroprocessing uh, process. The PWR span fuel is uh, degraded and the oxide form of the uh, span fuel is uh, converted into metal form in the electrolytic reduction process reduction of process here. And then the metal form of the spent fuel uh, goes through the process of uh, electro refining and the electro winning. This is the, the main part of pipe processing and the recovered uh, plutonium and some uh, uh, actinide would be uh, uh, pure to uh, feed to the uh, first reactor, which I guess. During this process, all uh, produce uh, waste, radioactive waste is a high level waste. The fantasy of uh, pyroprocessing effect was uh, already explained by uh, Professor Frank Van Hitter. Uh, it's a uh, separation and uh, use of plutonium is not economic. Separation and uh, fission plutonium, fission of plutonium does not significantly reduce the already small risk from uh, deep buried spent fuel. Separated plutonium is a direct use nuclear weapon material. So better to leave it uh, in spent fuel for burial in a uh, deep repository. And also the reduction of the uh, geologic disposal area claimed by Kelly would require leaving uh, Cesium-137 and strium 90 on the surface for hundreds of years until more than 99% decayed. And in, in South Korea, can the spent fuel uh, would not be pile processed and would be uh, directly disposed in, in, in geology uh, repository. And this uh, slide shows uh, the pile processing is not proliferation resistance. The pipe processing uh, proponent uh, argues that because of pipe processing uh, does not separate the pure protogen, it, it is a uh, proliferation resistance and, and it, uh, uh, it cannot be a, a weapon to propose something like that. But uh, the, the, this report uh, published by uh, the DOE of the US that, that uh, you know, including the six uh, national laboratory uh, proves that uh, pile processing is not re uh, proliferation resistance. And the conclusion, the Korea Atomic Energy Research uh, rationale of pile processing is to reduce the volume heat load and the toxicity of the spent fuel, and therefore reduce the area and toxicity of a final repository site so that South Korea could accommodate. However, even adopting a uh, pile processing of a uh, uh, PDWR spent fuel, South Korea needs a geologic disposal site for high level waste from pile processing and also candle spent fuel. So, pile processing would only make nuclear proliferation and the terrorism risk worse 
and it does not reduce uh, environmental impact of radioactive waste at the huge cost. It's a short, but uh, I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you, Jungmin. Um, I'll now turn to, uh, you want to turn off your share screen? Yeah, I'll now turn to request Masa Takubo to take over and explain what's happening in Japan and its own disastrous experience with reprocessing. Both within and outside the country. Masa, you opened Jung Min's presentation. Masa, are you there? You're sharing Jung Min's presentation and you're muted. You're muted, yeah, okay, yeah. Masi, you have to unmute yourself. Brett, yeah, can you speak up? Just a second, can you hear me? Yeah, we can Somehow. hear you now. Yeah, can you change the can slide? You... Yeah, we can hear you. Can you see my slides? We are seeing Jungmin slides. Yeah. Just a second. Sorry about this. Uh, Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Okay, so um, this shows the basic situation of Japan's reprocessing situation. In and first we had have a contracted uh, reprocessing for reprocessing in UK and France, and plutonium is coming back now. And then we built. Tokai pilot processing plant, followed by an industrial scale Rokasho processing plant, which is to be started in a couple of years. And, uh, and then as for uh, breeder reactors that uh, Frank explained about, we have an experimental fast reactor called Joyo, which is uh, planned to be resurrected in fiscal year 2024 or later. And the Monji prototype breeder reactor uh, has been shut down and it's being decommissioned. And we have only four reactors using plutonium uh, fuel among the 10 reactors that uh, uh, have been restarted from the Fukushima accident. And and as a result of all of this, Japan has a huge amount of plutonium worth uh, thousands of uh, uh, nuclear bombs. So how did we get here? Um, we first had the dream of a plutonium fast breeder reactor as uh, uh, which, which is around the world as uh, Frank explained. Uh, FBR is best suited to Japan's conditions, and this this is uh, this is from the 1956 long-term plan by Japan Atomic Energy Commission, and uh, the assumption was that there will be uh, a scarcity of uranium uh, due to rapid nuclear power growth, and then India. Uh, tested its 
bomb in 1974, which led to uh, review by the Carter administration about the processing policy. And the administration changed its policy in 1977. And uh, uranium is not scarce and uh, radar reactors would not be uh, economically competitive. So this should have been the end of the reprocessing story in Japan. But reprocessing uh, programs continued uh, in Japan. We first shipped uh, uh, spent fuel to Europe between 1969 to 2001. And, and then Tokai processing plant started operation in 1977 when the Carter administration decided reprocessing and fast breeder reactor programs would not be economical and perforation could be caused by that type of program. And Qatar administration tried to uh, stop Japan from going forward with this plan, but uh, Japan resisted. And then uh, Rokkasho uh, industrial scale reprocessing plant started in 2006 uh, with the hot testing and, and Japan is still trying to uh, complete this plant. In 1995, Monju uh, fast breeder reactor experienced sodium fire accident. And this was another chance to end the reprocessing story for Japan. But Japan decided to go ahead with the reprocessing idea. And the solution for continuing uh, processing was to use plutonium separated as MOX use uh, in uh, uh, light water reactors. Uh, MOX meaning plutonium uranium mixed oxide fuel for light water reactors. In 1997, uh, Japanese utilities uh, disclosed their plan to use plutonium in MOX fuel. And the idea was to introduce a MOX fuel in seven, uh, 16 to 18 reactors by 2010. But in 2009, uh, utilities uh, review, revised the uh, schedule of the program and said 16 to 18 reactors by fiscal year 2015, and then Fukushima accident happened. In 2020, uh, utilities revised their programs again, and they are now saying 12 reactors by fiscal year 2030. And the, the situation is, as I said before, sorry, uh, running out of the battery. <laughs> Sorry about this. Okay. Um, there are only f f four reactors using MOX fuel among the 10 restarted reactors I said before. And utilities just announced their plan again for 2023. And, and the plan is now to consume 0.7 tons in 2023, zero in 2024, and 0.7 tons in 2025, and 6.6 .6 tons per year by 2030. This is uh, the last one is just a paper plan. This cannot be achieved. And as a result of this continuation of reprocessing and MOX use, few, uh, MOX use failure, uh, Japan ended up accumulating uh, lots of plutonium equivalent of more than 5,700 bombs. And, 
as this shows, um, the UK doesn't have a MOX plant. So this 22 tons of plutonium is just stranded in, in the UK. And France has a MOX plant, but it's, it's experiencing a technical problem. And right next to the local processing plant, they are building a MOX plant, but it's only 9.4% complete in October, 2022. So this plan may or may not be uh, completed uh, based on the experience in UK in particular. And if, if this doesn't come into operation, uh, plutonium separated by, at the local sugar processing plant cannot be consumed. And the original idea was to uh, breed plutonium and burn it in uh, uh, breeder reactors, which would produce more plutonium. But now they're saying the purpose of uh, reprocessing an fast reactor is uh, to uh, reduce the volume and toxicity of the waste to be buried underground. In 2014, basic energy plan deleted the word breeder from the first breeder reactor program. So they are now talking about fast reactor programs. Uh, in 2015, Japan Atomic Energy Agency, operator of uh, Monju reactor was declared by the Nuclear Regulation Agency unfit to run Monju safely. And the following year, government decided to shut, shut down Monju permanently, saying that Japan could still continue its fast reactor, not fast beta reactor, but its fast reactor development without Monji by joining France's Astrid program, which, is, which was established for radioactive waste management. But in 2018, Nikkei, Japanese Wall Street, Wall Street Journal sort of, reported that France conveyed its plan to freeze Astrid in 2020, meaning Astrid is dead. Then in June next year, Japan signed a memorandum of cooperation with the United States uh, on collaboration on development of a versatile test reactor, which is based on FER2 technology developed uh, in Idaho. But in March last year, VTR's uh, budget for fiscal year 2021 finally was decided to be zero, meaning that VTR is also dead. So um, so after the failure of uh, first reader reactor, they just continue to come up with different excuses for continuation of uh, reprocessing, reprocessing. And um, when plutonium is used in light water reactors, it comes into spent MOX fuel. And this has a higher heat generation and higher toxicity. So uh, somebody from the Agency for, Agency for Natural Resources and Energy of METI, Ministry of Economic, Economy, Trade and Industry asked, so what would you do with the spent MOX fuel? And he said, we intend to replace the spent MOX fuel again. And then he 
continued to say, as the how to reprocess uh, Spendmox wheel, we could tell you that this is not something to be done at the pressure reprocessing plant. And concerning the implement, uh, implementing entity and method, we could say those are a subject to be examined from now on. Concerning the timing of the processing facility for spent MOX fuel, there's nothing we could say now. And this means we need to have many cycles using fast reactors for hundreds of years to reduce volume and toxicity. And by that time, we are all dead. And Toyoshi Fuketa, then acting chair of uh, Nuclear Regulation Agency, had a different uh, way of uh, observing this situation. And he said, it, this is about uh, um, keeping Monju operating, uh, which was being discussed at the time. And Fuketa said the following, as an idea of utilizing Monju, there's a discussion about reduction of the volume of waste and detoxification of or nuclear transmutation. Although these things may be theoretically possible, there is no place to, to conduct separation or to produce fuel, which are requisite for implement, uh, implementing the idea. Producing just one pellet will cause a great fuss, right? To say that this idea is feasible, this might be possible as a principle 10 years or 20 years from now, but at present, there is no place to produce pellets, even one pellet under such a situation to say that Monju, if operated, will contribute to solving the problem of waste. Isn't this what you call fraudulent advertising in the private sector sense? So I think this sums up uh, the whole idea of uh, continuing processing. Uh, as I said at the beginning, Japan should have stopped, uh, discarded the idea of reprocessing in at least in 1977 uh, when the US changed its policy. But after that, they just have to come up with different excuses to continue uh, the failed program of reprocessing. And I hope that people in Canada could stop it from becoming a real uh, mess in your country. Thank you. Thank you, Masa. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to take, I, I see there are lots of questions, but I'm going to take my prerogative as the moderator to add a few comments just to sort of clarify some of the things which may not be uh, fully obvious to people who are new to the subject. Um, so I just want to you know, um, say first that this whole discussion about reprocessing, um, as both Frank and um, uh, Jungmin mentioned, uh, but I just want to emphasize it, it's a chemical process and it cannot by itself get rid of any radioactive substance. It cannot change a radioactive substance into a non-radioactive substance, right? So all it does is separate out the waste products, the radioactive materials into different waste streams. And you would still have to grapple with the question of how to deal with these waste streams. This is why Jung Min mentioned, for example, that in the Korean uh, pyroprocessing uh, scheme, they would have to deal with uh, the cesium and other um, you know, uh, radioactive nucleides, which have half-lives of the order of decades for several centuries before it can actually be dealt with. Um, and so there is a problem of, the, the problem of uh, dealing with radioactive materials does not go away whether you reprocess or not, okay? Uh, the second point which I want to emphasize is that the only possibility, possible reduction 
uh, in terms of radioactive materials is if you took out the plutonium, uh, which is one small component, and as Frank sort of mentioned, is not even the leading um, contributor to the radioactive dose from a, a geological repository. But nevertheless, the argument that people who are in favor of reprocessing make is that you could take this plutonium out and use it as fuel, either because you think you're going to run out of uranium, which is not true, but nevertheless, that's one argument that you hear, or because you think that it is going to deal somehow with the uh, radioactive waste problem. But I think the point that all the speakers made is the fact that the when the plutonium is being used in a reactor, in the you know they talked about MOX fuel, but it could be uh, which is mixed oxide fuel, which is a mixture of plutonium oxide and uranium oxide, but it could also be in the in the metallic form or in other uh, salt forms, as is the case with the ARC 100 proposal and the Moltex proposal. Uh, but the idea is that the plutonium will be used as fuel in a reactor. That what they don't really talk about and I think Massa sort of brought this up, is the fact that when you do use this in a, a reactor, that reactor will in turn produce a bunch of radioactive waste, which will include plutonium and other things. And you have to sort of deal with that. Uh, and um, the, the, in theory, you could do this whole transmutation stuff by trying to go on recycling and going to this kind of uh, infinite loop as it were. Uh, and um, try to get rid of all the radioactive materials, but that is only in the th in theory. In practice, it's almost impossible. The U.S. Um, National Academies looked at this in the mid 1990s and dismissed this possibility. So, just sort of these are the topics that come up in a lot of discussions. So I'm just kind of re uh, enforcing all of those things. And the last uh, comment I wanted to make is um, about pyroprocessing. Uh, in 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 Canada, the leading proponent of something which looks like pyroprocessing is this company called Moltex. Uh, Moltex has a what it calls a proprietary process, which it calls Watts, uh, waste to something uh, stable salt. Um, it's a black box, and we don't know what's happening inside it. Uh, uh, Moltex has not revealed a lot of details. And in fact, that's a great thing for them because whenever you say something about, well, this is going to have this problem, they say, you can't say anything about it because we don't, we have not told you what it is, right? Uh, but it's also possible that Moltex themselves do not know how to do it because they are making a whole bunch of claims, which I don't think will actually work out uh, in reality. So this is a paper process at best. And it's not, it's not clear whether it is pyroprocessing or not. Uh, that, that's the last thing which I want to say. Okay, so um, I wanted to sort of uh, go on. There's a lot of questions here, uh, but there were. I'll start with some questions that were purely clarification questions. Uh, the first one is to you, uh, Frank. Um, Frank, you had a slide on plutonium stockpiles with two green graphs side by side, uh, and uh, Sarah would like you to revisit that and explain it again. Uh, and while you're bringing it up, I also say she was also asking about the question of why uh, governments uh, like uh, the in the United Kingdom um, try to get rid of this plutonium, uh, the weapons plutonium stockpiles by burning it in nuclear reactors instead of uh, down blending it and burying it uh, as a waste form. So maybe you can also talk about the larger problem of disposal of uh, weapons grade plutonium uh, that both the UK and in the past the United States have dealt with. Uh, yes, th th this this was the uh, the graph that you were asking about, right? Um, That's right. Yeah, and 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 what was your question about it? So just you know, can you revisit and explain again what is actually happening here? Right, 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 right. Uh, let me uh, make it full screen here. Uh, so, so um, what you see here on the left uh, figure is is uh, the beginning of on the left of it of it. You see the beginning of the you, you, that the dominant um, uh, cause of of uh, reprocessing plutonium separation uh, for for the first twenty or actually more like thirty years. Uh, thir uh, 35 years uh, was for weapons. 
and you you can see that's the gray and and you can see that at, uh, about 200 tons of plutonium uh, were were separated for that purpose with the end of the cold war uh, the the number of nuclear warheads that which is dominantly um, possessed by russia and and the united states were reduced by about a factor of 7 and and so that's why that gray that gray um, uh, area shrinks as we go uh, toward um, you know to, to to twenty to where we are today. Uh, the material that was extracted from the excess warheads uh, was the, was uh, divided into uh, material that was declared excess and in, into uh, weapons reserves. Uh, so that's that's the story with the with the weapons plutonium. Now on top of that is the civilian plutonium, and you can see that in the 1970s uh, separation began and accumulation of civilian plutonium began, and then uh, on the right hand figure is a blow up and, and of that of, of of that history since uh, 1995 roughly when when. Uh, Countries started uh, some the countries with the biggest stocks started uh, sharing uh, information about uh, how big their stocks were, and and you can you can see that uh, there were for a while uh, other countries uh, that that uh, in Europe uh, that, that were sending their spent fuel to the UK and to France to have plutonium separated out because. They thought uh, that there were going to be plutonium breeder reactors in the future and that, and that therefore they should have stocks to start up the plutonium. In the end, uh, none, of, none of those countries uh, actually operated a breeder reactor. And so they used uh, their plutonium up. They stopped separating plutonium in France. They stopped sending their spent fuel to France and the UK to have the plutonium separated and they used their they had their plutonium fabricated into um, uh, into mox fuel for, for their light water reactors, except the the uh, plutonium in the UK, which built a, a mox fuel fabrication facility that didn't work, and and in the end, uh, the UK took possession of that plutonium, said it would get rid of it. Uh, so, so the, the UK actually has the largest civilian stock of, of separated plutonium in the world. And it, it, it doesn't know what to do with it. It's exploring two possibilities. One is to use it as mocks, but the, the, as I mentioned, the, um, the Electricity de France, which operates its re the UK reactors, doesn't want to have anything to do with mocks in the UK. It's forced to to uh, to use mox in France, but it it, it, it is refused, and so the alternative uh, that the UK has been working on uh, is is to uh, mix mix the um, plutonium with a ceramic material and and bury it in its in its uh, if it's able to locate a uh, 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 site a um, an underground repository it would. It would be deposited there with the with the uh, the, the unreprocessed uh, re, uh, spent fuel, which the UK is now accumulating because it's not reprocessing anymore. Uh, I think I explained France and the situation in France and and uh, and, and uh, Japan and and in Russia. Um, so, uh, is there anything anything that I haven't covered that you wanted me to cover? Um, is there a reason why they are uh, preferring to use it as MOX fuel as opposed to just burial, or you think uh, they are op open to both? I, th I think uh, uh, it's very difficult for them to for the bureaucracy to admit that it has made a mistake. Uh, and there is also this convenient thing that that it, it at least all the radioactive waste is localized in one place. Uh, it, the other, the other, there's also a related argument. Uh, you know, in, in the United States, we have a very hard time uh, shutting uh, 
uh, military bases, even when they're not needed. They become part of the local economy. And I think in the, in the case of, of France and, and in Japan, uh, their reprocessing plant, the Japanese reprocessing plant is obviously not operating it, but, but they, they, uh, they employ huge numbers of people in poor areas because it's, it's poor areas that have, that have been, been willing to accept uh, these big plants for the jobs. Uh, and and so once you establish, uh, you know, such a facility as a sort of the uh, the largest employer in a region, then the then the politicians from that region will will fight to continue it in operation. And and so that's that I think is part of the part of the reason. The other part is is that um, is the ideology um, persists in the in the in the nuclear bureaucracy. That somehow they think that that the, the future that that they that they expected to have happened by now may still happen in the future that we'll have will need and have breeder reactors. Great. Okay. Um, I want to now turn to Masa. Uh, Masa, there's a question about uh, from Linda Penskunter on what has caused such a long delay between Rokasho's hot testing in 2006 and then still not be operational in 2023, if she understood that clearly. Um, and he says, it, this seems to be typical of the long delays for anything nuclear, but is there a specific reason? Um, one issue is uh, vitrification. Uh, when they uh, reprocessed uh, spent fuel for testing purposes, they ended up solution of highly radioactive waste. And the, the plan was to uh, vitrify it mixed with uh, glass elements and, and uh, come up with a canister of a solid material. But that vitrification process didn't work. And so they, they tried to fix it for a long time. And, and then in the meantime, the, uh, the accident at uh, Fukushima happened. So that changed the regulation standards and, and uh, all the reactors and reprocessing uh, plant in uranium enrichment plant, they all have to be uh, fixed to uh, uh, comply with the new regulation standards. And this process is going on. The uh, JNFL, the operator of the plant, uh, doesn't know how to uh, answer the questions from uh, regulator and they have problem with uh, various documents. So, so this, this is just uh, continuing. Great, okay, thank you. Um, and I want to turn to you, uh, Jiang Min. Um, and there's a question here about why is Korea not proposing to reprocess can do spent fuel and only light water reactor fuel? And if I may sort of, uh, this is from Ol Hendrickson, who also asks, uh, in terms of the infinite recycling of plutonium, it appears that Japan has ruled out recycling of spent MOX fuel. Have any other countries successfully recycled spent MOX fuel? No. Yeah, for me, uh, why uh, Kerry uh, does not consider the pilot processing of uh, candle spent fuel is that uh, uh PWR spent fuel contains uh one percent of plutonium and uh point one percent of other actinides. But uh for candle reactor, uh candle spent fuel contains uh, 0.4 percent of uh plutonium uh in the spent fuel and uh, much less uh, uh percentage of other actinides. So from the pure perspective. Uh, of the uh, first reactor, the 
candle spent fuel, the, you know, pile free setting cost of candle spent fuel would be, uh, you know, more than twice times of uh, Pilbara spent fuel. And also, uh, from the aspect of uh, disposable spent fuel, uh, candle spent fuel uh, has a, a very uh, lower burn offs uh, than uh, Pilbara spent fuel. So it's uh, much easier uh, uh, for candle spent fuel to be uh, disposed in the geologic disposal. So uh, Kelly does not consider uh, candle spent fuel pile processing. Thank you. Does anyone want to take on the question of uh, spent MOX fuel and recycling that? Frank, you're muted. Uh, I think France has uh, reprocessed a few tons of MOX fuel to show that it can do it, uh, but but the it's it's its reprocessing plant is not is not uh, set up to do that in on a large scale, uh, and. Uh, so, so it's, and and the other the other reason is that the plutonium in MOX fuel uh, contains um, uh, the percentage of plutonium isotopes that will chain react in a water in a water cooled uh, reactor is much lower uh, because because uh, the, the, in in the water re cooled reactor. A, a significant fraction of those isotopes are are efficient, but the but the uh, the other isotopes are are not because the neutrons are too slow, and there, therefore it's 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 um, uh, and there are no fast reactor no fast neutron reactors to to use that plutonium if it were separated out of the mock fuel, so so uh, it, it's been a very it, it's it, it's been a very low priority and. And I think um, in France, the the the, uh, the agency that is responsible for uh, spent for burial of um, of spent fuel or or radioactive waste is uh, you know is, is preparing plans for a burial of the mox fuel if in fact it's never reprocessed. Okay. Um, yeah, Masak, but. Uh, Japan has not officially given up the idea of reprocessing spent MOX fuel. Um, the original idea was to uh, build a uh, second reprocessing plant after Rokkasho. And the role of that second reprocessing plant was supposed to be to uh, reprocess uh, ordinary light water reactor uh, uranium spent fuel and spent MOX fuel and spent fuel from uh, FVR, uh, fast breeder reactors. And that has not, the construction has not started. And as, as I sh uh, showed in, in one of the uh, slides, they have not decided when to consider uh, this uh, second processing plant. But the idea was, uh, as Frank mentioned, if uh, spent MOX fuel is reprocessed, that plutonium uh, from that, that processing is to be burned in fast breeder reactors or fast reactors. So in reality, the idea is basically dead, but they have to uh, pretend as if this plan is still going. Uh, otherwise, they have to stop reprocessing to begin with. Okay, um, I'm going to turn to a question that has, I think, been answered during the talk, but it might be worth uh, reiterating that. Uh, the question is, over thousands of years, isn't the plutonium the cause of much of the other continuing radioactive materials in the waste since plutonium has a, such a long and varied decay chain. So isn't its contribution much more significant than it might appear? So, can, can I try to answer that? Sure. Uh, sure. The, the plutonium does uh, uh, dominate the heat 
coming from the spent fuel. Uh, and that and that is uh, what the, the people making the argument that that uh, it's it would reduce the toxicity. Uh, uh, you know have, that toxicity they measure by by the heat that it generates. And that would be true if, in fact, the danger was for somebody digging down uh, half a kilometer and eating the spent fuel. But if, if you, but in fact, what we're worried about is is uh, the the spent fuel uh, dissolving in groundwater and being transported up to the surface somehow, and and uh, and and getting into the human food food and and and, and water. Uh, and there, uh, uh, factors come in which reduce the uh, the the uh, the hazard from plutonium. First of all, it's not very soluble in in deep groundwater, and and second of all, that plutonium that would be transported to the surface is not concentrated in the food chain, and in fact, it's the opposite. Uh, the the uh, if you you know to the extent that you ate plutonium, most of it would pass through you. Only about 1% or, or less would actually be absorbed, very much unlike uh, you know, isotopes like cesium and, and strontium, which, which the body takes up. So, so that's, that's why uh, you know, what, what I, the curves I showed uh, did not reflect the heat uh, contributions into the repository. They, they reflected the, the um, uh, it, you know that, but then then uh, the, the, uh, the 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 diminution of the relative importance of plutonium by its low solubility and by its by the fact that it's it's rejected rather than concentrated in the food chain. Great. Okay. Um, another question which has come up uh, is, what are the environmental consequences of reprocessing? So on a on a purely environmental basis, what can be said about that? Well, maybe I can just say something and, and uh, that that uh, in in the United States we had two large scale reprocessing plants for military pur uh, purposes for for getting um, uh, plutonium for weapons. Uh, we never had a, we did have a small uh, reprocessing plant that operated for a few years. And then uh, and then shut down uh, because it wasn't not economic. The the two large reprocessing plants have become a hundred billion dollar cleanup projects, uh, and hundred billion dollar and a hundred year cleanup projects. Uh, that's also true of, of uh, the other the other side uh, uh, of a large reprocessing complex in in the UK. Uh, where, where I think it's 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 uh, about a hundred billion dollars estimated uh, will cause will, will will cost to clean up that site. So the, these 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 um, costs were never were not factored into in, in, in when they when those uh, plants were built. Um, modern plants may may cost less to clean up. Uh, uh, but I think they would still be very costly, and 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 so the, and then of course there's the radioactive waste, which which has, uh, which would would have to be buried, and also the uh, for if you have a mox plant that becomes itself a uh, uh, a cleanup uh, requirement when it when it stops operating. Yeah. Okay. We we have lots of questions, so I'm going to have to pick and choose. Um, there's one question here about uh, if not recycling, what is the answer for dealing with today's uh, stockpile of spent fuel, which I know is a very divisive question. Uh, so I'm just going to say, you know, I think uh, if I may summarize what you were saying, Frank and, and uh, Jungmin and Masa, it is that reprocessing does not preclude the Pract the necessity of building a, a repository somewhere. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. Yeah. So in, in a way, there is no good answer to that question. That's a big topic. And I think that's a, I'm going to sort of focus here on reprocessing and not try to answer the bigger question of what we should be doing with it. I mean, 
lots of people have opinions, but in the interest of sort of time, I'm going to uh, move away from that. Uh, and uh, one other uh, sort of question that uh, uh, was asked about is the uh, is about what is the VTR, the versatile test reactor? And I'd like to sort of add on to that the uh, issue of the VTR was sort of a scaled up version, as I understand it, of the EBR2. And the uh, proponents of uh, fast reactors often talk about the EBR2 as being a very successful prototype and a lost opportunity for not reproducing that. And it's been the source of the ARC 100 design, the PRISM design, uh, and the integral fast reactor design. Any comments on the EBR2 and why we shouldn't be thinking of that as a role model? Well, well, just briefly, the, ver the versatile test reactor. Well, well basically, I, I, I was in briefly in the um, Clinton administration, uh, in the working in the White House in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and while I was there, the decision was made uh, to shut down the experimental breeder reactor too, and and. Uh, in fact, it was an anomaly because the breeder program had been shut down in 1977. Uh, but here we were in 1993, and, and this experimental breeder reactor, uh, small experimental breeder reactor, um, uh, uh, didn't generate a significant amount of electricity, uh, was still operating at the Idaho National Lab Laboratory. Uh, so we shut it down, and 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 um, uh, and and then when when uh, the 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 uh, re the the people who were working uh, uh, on the experimental breeder reactor number two at Idaho started finding some receptive ears in the Congress. Uh, uh, for for their ideas that, of of that this that this still might be the future of nuclear power sodium cooled reactors, uh, th then they said, well, if we're going to have uh, fast neutron reactors, again, we'll need to have an experimental facility at the Idaho National Laboratory uh, to test the fuel and the materials that will be used uh, in these future uh, fast reactors, uh, and so that was the idea was the versatile test reactor. Uh, that would be a bigger, better replacement of the experimental breeder reactor number two. And uh, but but then um, Bill Gates was 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 uh, persuaded uh, to to back uh, to to back of uh, the construction of a fast a prototype fast um, uh, a neutron reactor in in Wyoming uh, with the cost sharing from the Department of Energy, and uh, and and the Congress asked, well, why should we be building two of these? Uh, that that reactor too was going to be based on the design of the experimental breeder reactor number two, and so the Congress then then uh, refused to to fund the the versatile test reactor at at, at Idaho. Um, whether it was, a, I don't know what, I mean, it, it, uh, it was the last reactor that, that, um, that Idaho National Laboratory fast reactor that they operated, they loved it. I, I don't know whether there was any, and, and, and they promote its, 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 its virtues, but I, I don't think it was much, that much different from all the other failed, failed uh, uh, prototypes that were built around the world. Right. Okay, um, we are running out of time, but I'm going to be greedy and ask one last question. Uh, and here I'm going to be a little provocative and pick a question um, where uh, the, the questioner asked, Jim Hansen is a, a persistent advocate of nuclear power. And as we know, he has been pushing uh, fast reactors using plutonium as fuel. And he wants to know who, who is taking him on. Uh, and I know Frank, we, we've had some experience with him, so maybe you want to say a little bit about that. Well, I was uh, uh, the 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 head of the 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 nominee for for being the head of the uh, the, the the who became the Secretary of Energy in the Obama administration uh, was was convinced by Jim Hansen that that that. Um, 
uh, sodium cooled reactors or breeder reactors with the future. And um, and so I was asked to to uh, to educate him and also to try to educate uh, Jim Hansen uh, about the you know the problems uh, with with fast reactors. I think I did convince Chu, uh, but I never was able to convince Hansen. Uh, and he, and he's 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 continued to be an advocate of these yeah. reactors. If I, if I may add, I think uh, when I was in Princeton, we extended an invitation to him and his group to come and spend a day discussing this with us. And uh, if I remember right, his uh, response was, I won't touch this group with a barge pole. Uh, <laughs> in, basically, he doesn't want to be convinced uh, of the problems of this. And, and in part, I, I don't blame him because I think he's been talking about climate change for so long with so little success that he is holding on to straws at this point. And so he may not really want to know much more about this. Uh, but anyway, I think we are out of. Sorry. No, he's he's a great man as, in in terms of his contributions with regard to uh, alerting the world to climate change. But but I I think on this one, he 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 he's um, he was convinced by by somebody uh, and 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 wants to stay convinced. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tom Bleas. Uh, but anyway, that's a separate issue. Um, I think this is time for me to turn the uh, thing back to Brennan to close the proceedings. Do you want to do that or can I just say thank yes. you? Thank you very much. Excellent moderation, Ramana. And with so many questions, difficult to juggle. And thank you to our three speakers, uh, Frank Massa and Young Men. You were all excellent. And uh, I think this is a very dense topic for many of us. So perhaps we need a day but you did an amazing job at covering this material in an hour and a half. And we wanna really very, very, very much thank you for that. Um, this is the last in the series of four uh, Nuclear Waste Online series, and uh, the second in a series of monthly webinars uh, for the Nuclear Waste uh, Watch a campaign to uh, ban reprocessing in Canada. And uh, we are, um, a recording will be posted to Nuclear Waste Watch's YouTube channel, and a link will be added at reprocessing.ca. And we have, uh, you know, uh, the next four weeks is our, is our remaining push to really try to secure a ban on reprocessing. Uh, in Canada, we are expecting the radioactive waste policy uh, to be released at some time within the next quarter, although we thought that last quarter and the quarter before and the quarter before that. So we'll, uh, so we'll see, um, but uh, please do join us and uh, we will be following up with everyone who registered. Just a reminder with the links on where to find the recording uh, and uh, next steps in the campaign. So again, thank you so much, Ramana, uh, Masa, uh, Young Min, and Frank, it was a, a really a privilege and an honor to have you with us tonight. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.